Welcome to Hot Chips 23. Session 6. Networking. Morning. Uh, this is going to be the networking session uh, at Hot Chips, and uh, I guess you know I used to be on the compute side, moved to networking side about a dozen years ago, and I was was quite amazed at how much complexity, how much really interesting things are being done in networking, and I think that's only gotten more so. And I think you'll you'll uh, I hope uh, seeing all the crowd out here that uh, those are you know folks who will recognize that uh, that there is a lot of interesting networking stuff versus just the early risers, if you will. But uh, anyways, just to get things going, we're going to see all three, or at least three major portions of networking here, both in terms of uh, the first talk on more at the phi layer, and then a talk at the uh, switching layer, and then another talk at the host adapter layer. So uh, without uh, taking any more time, I want to introduce uh, Ramin Sharani and Ramin Forjadra from Aquantia, who are going to uh, tell us about the, the very hard problem of making 10G based T uh, work. Gentlemen. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. OK, let's start with the Ethernet history. Uh, when I first joined the Ethernet industry in 1987, 10 megabit Ethernet was running on coaxial uh, cable, on the, if you recall, on the thin uh, black or the yellow thick ones. And uh, that was the true CSMA CD, carrier sense multiple access with collision domain invention of Bob, Bob Metcalf. I've seen the progression of Ethernet uh, as it got deployed over twisted pair, and I've seen it go, we've all seen it go from 10 meg to 100 meg to gigabit. And now recently, uh, uh, on the copper, it's going to 10 gigabit per second. As most of you know, Ethernet is very commonplace. It's the most dominant local area networking protocol. And over a billion uh, twisted pair ports have shipped so far. So what does 10G based T mean? 10G stands for 10 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, sorry, 10G stands for 10 gigabit per second data rate. Base is an acronym for baseband versus broadband modulation. And T refers to twisted pair and LDPC encoding. So let's talk about uh, power and density of the PHI, which is a key enabler. Uh, low power and small footprint of the PHI IC are the main catalyst for real market deployment. On the server side, as we all know, uh, airflow restrictions on the motherboard dictate uh, passive cooling. And to get to passive cooling, an integrated dual port Mac Phi chip needs to consume less than 10 watts. Over the past five or six years, over a number of generations of product in 10G based T, starting from 90 nanometer now to 40 nanometer, such a product is uh, realizable. And soon, in the next few months, you will see the Romney generations of servers enabled with such ICs. For high-speed density switches, as you can see in the picture, it is desirable to fit uh, eight ports. It's desirable to fit eight ports uh, of Phi behind a stacked RJ45. The RJ45 stack RJ45 basically consists of a RJ45 jack with integrated magnetics, right? In such a configuration, you got the most board efficient implementation of the PHI. Obviously, your Y dimension is the smallest possible. Your, your MDI traces from the PHI to the MAC jack are the shortest. So from a signal fidelity perspective, it's very clean. And from a front to back airflow perspective, you have a very clean and you have a very consistent um, temperature profile. 
a Quantia's 25 by 25 quad is the only product in the world that enables single row implementation for multi-port switches uh, in the industry today. So let's talk about the Tenji Base D environment for a second. Tenji Base D is designed to run over 55 meters of CAT5 or 100 meters of CAT6 or CAT7. We're running, effectively, we're running 2.5 gigabits per second full duplex over each pair. And the transmission is done, uh, you know, receiving and transmitting on the same line. So there's significant echo challenges. And as you can see, four pairs of wire, even though the twist rates are different, you still get significant near end crosstalk and far end crosstalk uh, noise from the adjacent pairs. Now, in a typical uh, data center application, where the wires are pulled in a six around one configuration, as you can see here, there could be a scenario where you have a victim cable and you have six aggressors, and all of these aggressors are basically inducing alien next on top of the uh, victim cable. All of these impairments have to be taken into account for a proper design of a 10G base D for it to operate, to, for it to have a chance of operating at 100 meters. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's worth noting that uh, the insertion loss for 10G base D at Nyquist is about 45 dB. And uh, comparing that to the gigabit previous generation, we had uh, at Nyquist, we had about 20 dB of insertion loss. The Shannon limit margin for um, 10 G base D is less than 2 dB, right? So basically what the IEEE standard did is they pressed as much as possible into the wire, getting it very close to the Shannon limit, whereas the previous generation was uh, greater than 20 dB limit. Duplex transmission is there, and the echo power at the end of a 100 meters cable is about 6 to 9 dB greater than the signal power. The near-end and far-end crosstalks are significant and has to be canceled. An alien crosstalk from the uh, adjacent 6 around 1 configuration has to be accounted for in chip design. So let's talk about the technical requirements. Industry requirements are... Uh, from a bit error rate perspective, dictate a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 15, even though uh, the standard calls for 10 to the minus 12. To achieve uh, this level of uh, uh, bit error rate, a few things have to fall into place. From an equalization perspective, we need uh, pre-equalization, which is done in the form of Tom Linson Harishima precoding, and with a receive feed forward equalizer, as you will see in the next slide. From an echo cancellation, you need at least 60 dB of echo cancellation, 40 dB of next cancellation, and 20 dB of fixed cancellation. On top of that, you need to be very cognizant of radio frequency interference. As walkie-talkies are turned on, common mode couples onto the wire, and then it gets translated to differential. And you need to have UHF and VHF interference cancellation. After all of this, your bit error rate is nowhere near enough and what you have to do, you have to throw a strong LDPC uh, at the problem, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, it's a 2048, uh, uh, three, uh, 320, uh, 328 parities and 328 equality node uh, LDPC. So let's talk about the top level architecture. So as you can see in this diagram, uh, the signal comes in through the line. It goes through a mag jack, which is a combination of a jack and an isolation transformer. We go through a summing node, through a uh, gain stage with some level of boost. We go through a high fidelity analog to digital converter. And at that point, the data is presented to digital. Uh, in the digital domain, majority of the digital logic, so in fact, 80% of the digital logic on our chip actually consists of digital uh, uh, FIRs, final impulse response filters, for feed forward equalization, RFI cancellation, FEX cancellation, NEXT cancellation, and ECHO cancellation. These are not based on uh, DSP processors. These are actually based on hardwired digital logic uh, that do about 10 terabits of operations per second to uh, detect the signal and be able to extract it from the noise. The data then is presented 
to the forward error correction in the form of LDPC, and post LDPC, the bit error rate gets to better than 10 to the minus 12 and goes through the Ethernet physical uh, coding sublayer for descrambling and data uh, deciphering. And then the CERDIS actually takes it and gives it to the upper layer protocol. On the transmit side, what's worth mentioning is the existence of Tom Linson Harishima pre-coding as a pre-equalizer. Think of it as a sophisticated pre-equalizer, followed by a transmit DAC and a transmit driver, and the associated circuitry for echo cancellation. In fact, what we do is we do echo cancellation not only in analog, but we also do it in digital. So there's multiple prong of echo cancellation to get to the 60 dB desired level. So the design challenges for 10 G base T. Some of the ones that are worth mentioning in this presentation. Innovations in LDPC to achieve low error floor while maintaining low power. I'll cover that in a few slides next. Efficient implementation of cancelers, RF interference canceling techniques, uh, high fidelity and low power data acquisition, on-chip power management mechanisms, and on top of all of that, uh, sophisticated firmware deployment for interoperability and power management. So let's look at the forward error correction uh, in, in, in a few minutes, hopefully in less than five minutes. So LDPC provides about 10 dB of coding gain and gets us from a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 3 to better than 10 to the minus 12. A few, a few learnings that we've gone through at Aquantia, which is worth mentioning, and I'll detail in the next few slides, are ideally LDPC should be designed to handle 10 iterations. Iterations are when messages are passed from the parity to the equality node in computing and correcting the errors. But generally, almost all the time, three iterations are more than sufficient. We leverage this fact to actually do the LDPC design, as I'll show you in the next slide. LDPC code structures in general are inherently flawed in the sense that they have trapping sets. There are a specific code words in LDPC which are always undecodable, but the probability of happening of these code words are small. That's why you, know, you still get better than 10 to the minus 12 bit error rates. But we do have a technique to detect them and to correct them. Given the LDPC's 2048 equality and 384 parity nodes, if you do the math on the number of wires and the resolution required to get a digital circuit going, you will see that you're gonna need about 200,000 wires going back and forth just for message passing, right? And if you just wanna do a pure parallel implementation, it makes it impractical. So let's talk about uh, the time extension concept. As for the first learning that I mentioned above, uh, what we do with LDPC is we augment the LDPC with input FIFO and output FIFO. We heavily leverage the fact that the, error, the, error burst are, the errors are bursty, and in fact, what we can do is we can have some, uh, uh, we can have some uh, uh, frames stored in the, outside, uh, in the output FIFO, and Generally, for almost all the time, the decoder would resolve the decoding in three iterations, which is uh, you know, almost 99.9% .9 of the time. But in case one in 10,000, if a packet ever comes in that requires more than three iterations and it requires, let's say, 10 iterations, what we do is we store the incoming data on the input FIFO while the output FIFO maintains the uh, data to the associated circuitry, so maintains the data flow. And meanwhile, what the iterative decoder does, it actually gets, it borrows time, and it gets time to do 10 iterations. In doing so, effectively, we are running the LDPC at half speed, and as you can, as you can uh, easily see, half speed would save us a lot of power. In the next generation that uh, we've done, as an uh, additional technique that we've added to this, we've added a VCO ring oscillator and a supply regulator. And we look at the FIFO monitor, and based on the FIFO monitor signal, we do dynamic clock adjustment, and we do dynamic supply adjustment, right? The question is, well, how do you do dynamic supply adjustment? Well, on the chip for every digital block, we have a linear regulator built in, which, you know, your normal traditional headers, but we've turned them into linear regulators, and we are able 
with the processor's help, with the, external, with the internal processor's help to monitor the FIFO and set up the regulator and set up the VCO. So you would actually get the most optimum power based on uh, the cable configuration. Let's quickly touch base on the LDPC error floor. So LDPCs are inherently flawed, as I said, because they do have error floors in the form of trapping sets. And effectively, what we've done in a nutshell is we've identified all of these trapping sets, we've tabulated them, and we have put them in a separate digital logic post the LDPC. And effectively, once we detect any of these trapping sets, we go ahead and decode the trapping sets and we correct the errors. So as you can see, with a low resolution implementation, you get the green line. With a better resolution, you get the black line. And with the LDPC decoder in a uh, bit error rate versus SNR curve, you actually get the red line. So basically, you improve the uh, error rate significantly. I'm not going to get too much into the wire complexity. I want to leave some time for my colleague here. But effectively, what this slide is saying is that we can go from 200K wires to 12K wires if we do serial communication in a bidirectional fashion. And however, the toggle rate significantly goes up. And the way to get around that would be to do uh, difference communication and only send the difference of the messages from every iteration to every iteration. Ramin? Thank you very much, and uh, uh, good morning. I'm going to uh, cover the rest of the uh, architecture. Uh, as Ramin explained, the top-level architecture is very similar to the 1G architecture with, uh, with, with uh, certain subtleties, differences, in, in the terms of that the fact that you're using the LDPC for a higher gain, but in gigabit, you're using the Viterbi, which only provided 6 dB, which is not enough uh, coding gain for this case and that will result into some architectural differences. But the rest is overall the same, but the complexity is significantly higher. We're doing 10 terabits of operation per second uh, in this architecture. So just uh, first, I'm going to cover this section of the digital cancelers uh, that where the difference comes from. The fact that uh, for channel equalization, the low-pass channel equalization, uh, we have to use uh, some sort of decision feedback equalizer versus the high-pass filtering, because high-pass filtering will result in noise amplification that even for gigabit was not good enough. But to do this decision feedback equalizer, we need to make sure that the uh, bit error rate is low enough, otherwise it results in error propagation. So it has to be together with the feedforward error correction. That in 1G, it was simply doable because we used uh, uh, Viterbi decoder, and Viterbi decoder had very low latency, but uh, because of the 10 dB gain we need, uh, it resulted in uh, uh, higher latency, and therefore we had to do it in the transmitter side through uh, Tom Lisson Hiroshima. And that will lead to 10 bits at the transmit side, that we have to transmit 10 bits instead of 3 bits. That by itself will extend the data input to the filters. Uh, at the same time, the, date, the bit time is 1.25 nanosecond in 10G, while in uh, 1G it was 8 nanosecond. And that by itself will extend the length of the filter to cover the uh, cable by this ratio. And lastly, the amount of uh, cancellation we have to do is 20 dB higher. So putting all that together just for the uh, cancelers, we see that we have the 30 times uh, larger or more complex uh, filter requirement that to achieve that, we need to use significant uh, optimization and innovation. On top of that, in 1G, uh, the data bandwidth was up to like 62 and a half uh, giga megahertz, which was uh, all the FCC uh, uh, data transmission or s frequencies was above that. We could simply put a low pass filter. In 10G, we have 400 megahertz, uh, and we cannot simply use a, a low pass filter. Originally, conventionally, the, the approach was to put a notch filter whenever a single uh, frequency is detected, to put a notch filter to suppress uh, that filter. But that's interference frequency. But the problem with that was, first of all, the link had to be interrupted for you know, tens of milliseconds. And at the same time, uh, the data itself was getting notched. So the power of the data was uh, uh, eaten up, and the, the performance came down. So the approach we took was, in fact, we detect the interference through a special technique that we have. 
then we feed it to similar cancelers as the you know, echo cancellor, next cancellor, and it directly can subtract it from the data. And that has the advantage that there is no link interruption, uh, there is no uh, data uh, degradation or link performance degradation, and we can also address multiple tones uh, or even wine band data. Next on the analog side, uh, there are like a number of challenges. One of the challenges is that we have to provide less than one picosecond of uh, jitter. And for that, just a simple example is that uh, you have to, if you want to cancel, you know, echo at certain point, and because of jitter, you cancel at a different point, that delta results in error in cancellation. The other thing is that, of course, the receive paths should have better than 60 dB SNR performance, the whole thing. And especially the fact that on the transmit side, we are doing a bidirectional link, um, and the transmit signal is 45 dB stronger than the receive side, no matter how much digital equalization we can do, if the distortion of the transmit is worse, and because all the cancellation we do is linear, we cannot do anything about the distortion. So the distortion has to be 60 dB less. Here I'm going to show some of the different approaches that people have taken in the past. This is an innovative way of doing the, the hybrid cancellation or the transmit signal cancellation, which is on the same line, which is using passive lines that, as you see, there is a delay line that transmit signals goes to, through the line, and a similar delay line that feeds it back to the receiver. So as you see, the transmit signal going through these two paths will be the same. And once subtracted, they will go away. And only the receive signal that is going through a different path will appear at the output. That has the advantage, of course, you only use one uh, uh, TX stack, but a uh, number of disadvantages. First of all, any mismatch in these paths, as I explained earlier, any picosecond mismatch re result in degradation of the performance. Also, also for each lane, uh, we have to have 40 inches of uh, copper of wire uh, for these uh, uh, files that becomes a nightmare, rotting not nightmare. And also for uh, RF, or let's say emission, FCC emission or RF emission power, because we cannot control the age rates uh, of these DACs to certain limit, because as the more capacitor we put at these outputs, it results in uh, degradation of the uh, return loss, there's limits it, and that, that's why there's so much that we can limit uh, the RFI emission. This is another approach that eliminates the lines, but we have like a replica DAC, a similar DAC to this uh, TX DAC, which has the advantage that it removes the, the, the complexity of the routing but adds more power in these uh, two DACs, and at the same time, uh, the distortion of these two DACs will add up on everything, and it still has the problem of the RFI emission. The approach we took is basically using a single DAC and using some sort of like an analog mirroring to fit the thing, uh, to fit the line, and has clear the advantage we only use one DAC, no uh, long traces, uh, and of course, the big advantage here is that by controlling the capacitance here, isolated from the line, so it doesn't affect the return loss, but we can very well control the RFI emission. And as a result, uh, we can basically, in switches that are like 48 ports, we pass the uh, RFI emission without any problem, even using the long cables, while the other approaches, they have problems unless they use shorter cables to get the advantage of the TX power. This is just quickly touching uh, uh, on the, uh, some of the power management stuff that we do. Uh, as you see, as you go to finer and finer technologies, 40 nanometer uh, is the latest technology that we use. There's significant variation, even within a single, uh, single wafer, uh, we have two to three sigma variation. You see the whole process uh, variation on a single wafer. And this shows kind of the leakage of different wafers, as you can see. And with leakage being a significant problem, uh, we don't want to end up with chips that uh, one has significant power than the other one. Leakage can be at easily 50% of the overall power. So to mitigate that and to have like a relatively flat power independent of the corner of the process, we, do, uh, we use different techniques such as batch back biasing that adjust the threshold of the devices. Uh, if there's like low threshold, you are in the fast corner. And even if that's not enough, we use the supply scaling. If the part is still fast, we reduce the supply and take advantage of the V squared power scaling. And we all do that through the microcontroller that we have on chip. And uh, using the, some of the analog leakage and speed monitors that we have on chip and different places on the chip to detect you know, how fast the chip was, which corner of the process is, and also depending on the temperature, it knows how to adjust the back biasing and supply scaling very smartly. 
And all of this is done through uh, firmware control, uh, as uh, we showed you in the top level architecture. <coughs> we have a, a controller uh, that uses a firmware with over 100K of lines. I mean, this, this, this thing took us like about a year to really optimize it and come to the best uh, performance, depending on how we optimize things, how we fine tune things, and a different calibration in terms of analog and uh, digital that we do to actually meet the performance. I mean, there was no way that we could use the you know, hard-coded state machines that was done in uh, gigabit, for example, and people have done that. That was a failure uh, on their side. So, this thing was a huge uh, uh, help to get the performance for Tenji as we needed. And uh, <clears throat> lastly, uh, at the conclusion, the, uh, basically the cloud computing and server virtualization is driving the demand for a Tenji requirement, a Tenji link. And this link has to, for it to happen, has to be fairly inexpensive and easy to deploy and practical. And Tenji BASD is the best solution as long as is low power and also low area to result in uh, inexpensive uh, solutions for these options. And by technology getting mature, is getting there. And Aquanti has been the leader uh, in, in, in that front. Uh, our 90 nanometer chip uh, came out in 2009, the production uh, version of it. And uh, in fact, um, it's currently in the multiple switches platform. Uh, the first uh, switch shipped out of Cisco uh, was, in fact, using the 90 nanometer chip from Aquantia. And uh, for our 40 nanometer, which is currently in production, we started in early uh, 2009, doing the, all the analog chip, doing all the analog front ends, making sure everything is perfect. We did multiple test chips. And uh, getting the confidence on that, in 2010, it was sampled and currently uh, is in production and ramping up very fast. Thank you very much. Oh, of course, if there are any questions that we can answer. Satoshi Matsushita NEC. Uh, this product is quite attractive for me. Um, I have two questions. And the first one is uh, the uh, LDPC for data collection or the filter or uh, the uh, more latency in the Phi, because the Phi is uh, used in the, uh, uh, a lot of Phi is used in the transmission line. And the, I, I'm, I wonder the, the, the latency of the Phi, it, in, in, increase of the latency of the Phi. How much do, latency do you expect for the Phi? Uh, so, uh, yeah. So the standard calls for two and a half microsecond of latency total in the receive and the transmit. And with everything that we've shown in, these, uh, uh, in this presentation, we're still within that two and a half microsecond, right? Our, our architecture from uh, DSP perspective and filter perspective is in time domain, right? So we save on latency in that perspective, and we give some back on the LDPC. But we're, we're well within the two and a half microsecond that the standard asks for. Okay, and then second question is uh, the, the RF error and the noise, ex external noise, uh, because that LDPC, once that the LDPC synchronization is lost, it takes a long time to learn the synchronization between the files. So I heard it is a millisecond order. So is, do, how you improve the, the RF noise tolerance and the uh, AC, uh, 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 input po supply power noise lead uh, immunization. And then have you ever found that such kind of synchronization loss in, in the for the correction? Yeah, basically in the first approach, as I mentioned, uh, for it to detect where to put the notch at the, the interfering frequency, there is that certain period, I mean, can, as I mentioned, up to like 10 milliseconds or more uh, for it to, for the link to recapture itself. and to capture that lock of the frame and everything and do some uh, minor retuning of the filters. So that happens. But in the second approach, as I mentioned, because as soon as you detect the data, it immediately goes through the cancellation filter and cancels it. You don't have that interruption anymore. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, can, can you, um, uh, 
comment on um, base T versus uh, the, the, the SFP, the cage approach, where um, it's, in, in, in my opinion, it looks like the world's been tra trending from, from base T to cage approach. And um, can you comment on the power of your devices versus SFP plus modules? Uh, and I, I guess the latency is going to be a lot less on the uh, SFP plus modules. Yeah, certainly SFP plus modules latency is lower and the power is lower. But again, if you look at every generation of internet, right, from 10 to 100 to gigabit, once you get deployment of 10 G based integrated MacFi onto the server, right, and once you see two RJ45s on your server, which ships standard, right, which ships, you know, at almost no cost to you, then the server side will actually take off. And to get a SFP cage and try to do a pluggable module or mezzanine into the server is really not you know, that practical. Now, I'm sure that they will coexist, but our view of the market as we move forward, and surely Romney generation will be a testament to that, is that over the next six to nine months, you're going to see significant server takeoff with integrated MacFi uh, on the motherboard. And once you have it on the server side, the switch side will follow. Uh, yes, uh, with such uh, high complexity and uh, um, tight specs, has there been uh, any history of uh, interoperability problems between different people's files? Absolutely, absolutely. So we've had significant interoperability issues. In fact, the, most of the interoperability comes from the interpretation of the two-second training. And uh, there's been a lot of back and forth. Actually, the standard was ratified. Then we went back to standard that opened it up for uh, additional um, addendums to the standard to account for interoperability issues. And in all honesty, if it wasn't for having the processor and the firmware, the interoperability issues could never be resolved. But there's been, been quite a few, and we've, we've taken care of them. Thank you. All right, thank you. OK. Thank you. Yeah, good job. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I don't know if people picked up on that, but just to highlight the challenge of the, that problem there, they, they talked about doing terabit ops, and guys like me from Cisco would tell them it's got to be five watts or less. So it's not easy. Anyway, so our next, our, our next problem, our next speaker is going to introduce another area of networking which is extremely difficult, which is uh, high speed switching, again, to go along with the 10 gigabit sort of transmission at highly integrated. So welcome Mike Davies up from Fulcrum and I guess soon to be Intel. That's right. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, the Intel uh, acquisition is not quite closed yet, so it's still proper to be presenting this under uh, Fulcrum Slideware, uh, possibly one of the final presentations uh, that'll, that'll be that way. So I'll uh, start with uh, a bit of background on Fulcrum's Ethernet switch uh, product line. Dates back to 2005, 2006, when we started with the Tahoe device. This was in TSMC 0.13 micron. Uh, the key innovations of that uh, first generation chip was integration. So it had 24 ports of 10 gig, the first uh, Ethernet switch at that level. Also, the latency was a, a, a key innovation. Uh, no one really believed at that time that it was possible to do an Ethernet switch with such low latency. Uh, it was in the 200 nanosecond uh, realm. So we followed that, I mean, the, uh, as far as the frame processing pipeline capabilities of Tahoe goes, it was actually pretty simple. It was a layer two only switch, uh, so fairly primitive in that respect. So we followed that up with uh, our Bali chip, which expanded specifically in that frame processing pipeline part of the chip, added routing, uh, some data center bridging features, really focused on the complexity of the protocols that could be processed by the, by the switch. That was still in TSMC.13. It was effectively a derivative chip where we reused much of the layout from the Tahoe generation and just focused on the one main frame processing pipeline block in that chip. So meanwhile, of course, the industry has been moving along and uh, many, many new protocols have come around, uh, ongoing trends of convergence on ethernet, virtualization, scaling of the data center has uh, created a big need for a lot of new protocols uh, in switch silicon today. Uh, and in addition, of course, the scaling of the data center always is demanding more bandwidth. So this led to a, a pretty challenging specification for our Bali device, uh, a three times increase in the port count. So increase from 24 ports to 72, 
um, as well as increases in the shared memory, all the table sizes uh, increased by at least a factor of four. Uh, and then, of course, this long slew of protocols that uh, marketing guys were adding to every day that uh, they'd like us to uh, support. So that was quite a challenge. But that's what we undertook. We targeted 65 nanometer GP process TSMC. So uh, before I go on on the product, I, I should probably give a little bit, bit of background on uh, Fulcrum's secret, secret sauce. This is really the technology that motivated the founding of the company back in 2000, uh, and uh, is now Fulcrum is widely recognized as a pioneer in this field. This is asynchronous uh, circuit design. So there's still some controversy in some areas about whether it's, uh, you know, what its pros and cons are, whether it's uh, really suited for production uh, uh, chips. And as far as we're concerned, this is a moot point. It's been in every product Fulcrum has done to date. Uh, it has a number of advantages, certainly some disadvantages too. It's a tool in our toolbox we use uh, when appropriate. Uh, mainly our, our, the way we look at it these days is that it, it delivers custom level frequency with a design flow which is significantly more productive than a comparable synchronous custom flow. So we're a small design team, we're capable of producing circuits that run in excess of a gigahertz uh, with you know, pretty minimal amount of design effort and optimization. It also delivers uh, extremely good latency. Arguably, it's the best design style uh, available from a latency standpoint, which of course is useful in switching applications. It also, as it turns out, is uh, quite well suited for implementing circuits such as crossbars, SRAMs, and TCAMs. All of these two are very central to uh, switch uh, applications, which explains why that's where we focused in our application space. This slide here gives a, a, a little bit of deeper perspective on what the circuit microarchitecture looks like in the chip uh, in our asynchronous design style. Uh, what we have is effectively in the data path, a standard domino logic uh, structure. So uh, this, possibly the only difference here is that there's a two footer, two pre-charged transistors, whereas typically in a synchronous uh, design style, you'd have one. Um, and in the absence of any flow control, if all data is arriving at full rate, there's absolutely nothing in this pipeline that will slow down the evaluation of, of the data as it ripples through. So you get the absolute maximal uh, speed or the minimal latency of computation uh, through the pipeline. Now, uh, in addition to that data path, we don't have any clocks, of course, so what we have is uh, handshake sequencing logic. That's what's illustrated below here where we have input completion logic, detects when the input has arrived, output completion logic, which detects when the output has been fully computed, and then control logic, which is combining those signals, generating the backwards going acknowledge. That's mediating the transfer. If there's any stalls or hiccups or flow control, everything slows down uh, nicely. Okay, so back to the product and back to Alta. Uh, this diagram here really applies to all of our switch chips. They all have fundamentally the same architecture. It's a shared memory architecture. Uh, this particular slide is showing the Bali generations. I'll, I'll explain the, the differences. Um, but in a, at a high level, it, we have our data path, what we call the rapid array switch element here. Uh, crossbars, shared memory, SRAMs. We have a scheduler, which is uh, controlling that data path as far as where the input segments of the packets are stored and when they're spooled out and scheduled for transmission. Uh, data is being received and transmitted in small synchronous blocks, a very thin layer that uh, cuts up the packet into segments, and those segments are then handled in aggregate by the central parts of the chip. So what I haven't talked about here is the frame processing pipeline. So this block is receiving the very first segment of the packet, and it parses it, determines all the protocol handling, how the egress modification should be applied, and uh, where, what egress ports the, the packet should be delivered to. That information is then passed on to the scheduler, which uh, does its magic and, and spools the frames out on the wire. So in the Bali, both Tahoe and Bali generations, the frame processing pipeline, the key brain in there, the frame handler block, as we called it, was implemented synchronously. Uh, in Tahoe Bali, the frame rate, the maximum frame rate we had to handle was 360 megahertz, which was well within the capabilities of the synch synchronous standard place and route flow. So it was natural to implement that synchronously. Of course, that was the most functionally dense 
part of this switch. Uh, a lot of spaghetti logic, complicated uh, uh, hard-coded expressions that are uh, very well suited for RTL implementation. And that worked quite fine for, for Tahoe. Is, it was, frankly, very easy. For Bali, the next generation where we added routing, that was really the, the block that received all the focus of development. So that ended up being about 10 million gates. The majority of our design team spent the majority of their time implementing that block, whereas otherwise we were reusing all the layout for uh, the rest of the, the chip as is from Tahoe. So the plan going into, Al into Alto was to preserve and use that same basic architecture. Um, we, it was going to be a challenge to have a 3x increase in our performance with only a 50% improvement in frequency that the process scaling was providing, but we felt that we had the low-level innovations to make that work, uh, more clever reliance on dual-ported memories, just more careful design, uh, we felt would be able to uh, work for the, for the shared memory rapid array and the scheduler part. For the frame handler, the frame processing pipeline, our plan initially was to do a dual synchronous implementation where those two synchronous pipelines would coordinate and tap into uh, a shared asynchronous uh, tables and portions of that pipeline that would be too expensive to duplicate and uh, implement uh, as dual synchronous. So that was the plan going into it. Um, now to illustrate a little bit about the, the challenge from a protocol complexity we, were, uh, complexity we were facing in that frame processing pipeline, I'll go through the wish list of features that the marketing guys dreamed up, beginning with effectively two protocols that we had to worry about, or two standards really, in our first generation Tahoe device. Uh, basically just layer two switching and statistics. That was pretty much it. Going into Bali, there was maybe roughly a 3x increase. These bullet points aren't intended to be precisely correct or comprehensive. This is more for illustrative purposes, but let's say it's about a 3x increase. And that 3x increase uh, consumed all of our design resources for about 80% of the time. So going into Alta, we then had another doubling of the frame processing pipeline complexity, plus then we had the whole chip to do, the re-implementation at 3x performance of the, of the uh, data path in the scheduler, a redo of the port logic with 40 gig and KR, a number of other challenges. We uh, started to question our plan of, of uh, a dual synchronous implementation. Uh, it became pretty clear that we wouldn't have virtually any RTL reuse from the previous generation. Uh, many of these standards, in fact, were not quite well defined. Uh, the, the, the specs weren't stable. They were still in working committees. Uh, and there was just the, the sheer complexity of dealing with this uh, heterogeneous pipeline with parts of it synchronous, parts asynchronous. It was really starting to scare us. So we decided we needed to uh, rethink this and come up with a different approach, uh, largely attacking this from the standpoint of getting away from the uh, specific hard-coded details of all of these protocols and trying to implement something more basic as a just a, a singular asynchronous pipeline uh, in, in the simplest way possible. So this slide here is uh, just summarizing these challenges we're facing. The, uh, the data path and the scheduler actually went uh, pretty smoothly, really, in terms of area and schedule. Uh, it came together as we expected. Frame processing pipeline, we, we had to, as I say, come up with some innovations to uh, make this happen. And uh, really, there were two key innovations in Alta that, uh, that allowed us to be successful. The first was asynchronous place and route. So we needed to increase the productivity of our asynchronous design flow. We did that by catching up with the industry as far as the synchronous flow goes and introducing logic synthesis and place and route capability. Second innovation was to get away from those hard-coded details, as I say, and just implement something which is more generic and uh, uh, programmable at the fundamental compute level. So one slide here on the place and route flow. This isn't a CAD conference, but this is really quite notable about uh, Alta and, and this generation. Uh, so asynchronous place and route is not easy, uh, given the state of the synchronous uh, development flow. And there's all sorts of challenges that don't map very well into the synchronous place and route. So for example, all these handshake loop, loops that uh, exist between pipeline stages uh, give rise to cyclic timing constraints, and the synchronous tools simply don't support that. Um, our cell library is, in fact, mostly those handshake overhead uh, cells, not actual logic. 
So the, the, these challenges were significant. We did solve them. Uh, this is a workable flow, and in fact, to date, this Alta is the first chip to actually use asynchronous place and route in a production chip. Uh, arguably, it, it may in fact be the first chip to have place and route of dynamic logic, too. Now, the second innovation is what the rest of the talk is all about, and that's what's architecturally novel about, about Alta. So it began with uh, some, some simple observations about the, the common theme that arises. If you just look at the RTL of, say, the Bali device, what, what kept coming up was some simple repeated type of structures, so pattern matching, just looking for certain types of constants in, in the frame header, uh, for example. Uh, simple guarded assignments, so very simple conditions, easily expressible in a disjunctive normal form, uh, where then there's some assignment of an intermediate variable, which is then passed on, table looked up, or handled in some way. Uh, a lot of muxing, just simple muxing in response to that, those, uh, those simple guarded assignments. Uh, and then, of course, mapping tables, you know, various different shapes and sizes, uh, looking up MAC addresses or destination IP addresses, whatever it may be. Um, so then we, we recognize that th these common patterns are all uh, implemented in three types of circuit structures. There's TCAMs to implement the pattern matching, crossbars for moving the data around, assigning, muxing, that kind of stuff, and uh, SRAMs for, of course, for the table mapping. These are all very good circuits for our asynchronous design style, so we felt we were onto something. So here are a few slides that just kind of motivate the actual circuit structure we, we uh, arrived on. So this is um, just a, a, a simple syntactic decomposition of just a, a random example of uh, matching against uh, some header fields in the layer two um, header of a, of a packet, determining whether uh, the frame needs to be routed or not. And just some syntactic transformations, putting into a kind of a priority encoded form with uh, disjunctive normal form guards, and you arrive at something that looks like a standard CAM RAM structure. So the pattern matching and guards are implemented in the TCAM, and the SRAM is mapping out to the control for assigning some kind of action transformation to the header fields which are rippling down the pipeline. That is this structure here. So this is the fundamental processing stage we have in what we call our flex pipe uh, frame processing pipeline in Alta. So at the center of it, there's a bus of channels that are uh, rippling through the pipeline. Uh, these begin as header fields, literally from the packet, but then they get iteratively transformed and become intermediate variables of, of various different kinds. Ultimately, they become the egress fields which are going to be annotated or modified into the, the packet as it's transmitted. We have a, the standard CAM RAM structure I talked about, out of that action RAM, we have control for some fixed function stage of action logic, as we call it, and then the result of that action, fixed function evaluation, is muxed into the appropriate uh, data uh, field in that, that channel, that field bus. So as you iterate these and you <clears throat> construct a full pipeline, what you get is a very powerful structure. With each additional stage here, you get an exponential increase in the capabilities of that, of that pipeline. So uh, it's a, a very powerful structure. Now, of course, we can't make each of those action stages fully general and supporting a very, very wide class of whatever you might need at any point in the pipeline. We do have to restrict this and choose very selectively what types of, of fixed function actions are supported at different places. But nevertheless, there's a great deal of flexibility that uh, is, is, is maintained by that. So for a specific example, I'll go through uh, just uh, as quickly as I can the uh, configurable parsing that we have at the very beginning of the pipeline. So here, the, the parser receives the literal uh, first segment frame data off the wire, and uh, each word of that frame is passed into the TCAM along with some state from the, the action, the, the channels that are, the fields that are being passed down iteratively down the pipeline. Uh, the TCAM does its, uh, state machine sort of next state evaluation determines the, the control out of the, uh, the action RAM. The action RAM is controlling four fixed function stages. One of this is just a transformation of the, of the parsing state. Uh, that's this op uh, box there. Then there's a, a, a variety of, of bit fields, what we call flags, that can be set, which record certain properties about the frame. It might be that there was an IP header, there was an ISL tag, there was no MPLS uh, tag, for example. Uh, there's a checksum, a ones complement adder, which is about the most specific uh, fixed function 
piece of logic we need for parsing, and that's for uh, IP header uh, checking. And then we have muxing, of course, where it's selecting which parts of the literal packet are recorded and preserved for later processing. As you array those all together, you, you get a configurable parsing that supports up to some fixed maximum, maximum depth in the, in the packet. That's 128 bytes in Alta. Uh, those, each stage is handling three, uh, four bytes at a time, so we have a 3.2 nanosecond ripple time. That, that's the target anyway for Alta. Turns out that's very challenging to do even with the asynchronous design style, so that, that, that was our, our goal there. Now moving on, or backing out really to the 10,000 foot view, this is an illustration of the entire pipeline, where it begins there with the, with the parser illustrated, um, but there's many, many other stages that follow the same general structure as what I showed before, uh, that basic architectural template, but each stage is sort of tailored for different purposes. Some of them are geared more towards CAM matching, so pattern matching. Those are illustrated in blue. Others are geared more towards direct table lookups. Uh, those are the gray ones. And then still others, the, the focus is on that fixed function stage where there's a lot of complexity in that action logic, and those here are illustrated in green. I'll show very quickly uh, the FFU, another example here, which uh, you can see follows the same basic uh, structure as, as the architectural template, but uh, this, this block here is mainly for uh, supporting user rules matching conditions which are programmed into your canonical example would be things like ACLs and uh, routing rules, so matching against destination IP addresses, for example. So it does follow the same structure, but this is populated with uh, user uh, data and user configuration. And uh, this is an eye chart here, but this is basically just uh, illustrating, kind of giving some flavor of what uh, different types of fixed function action stages exist in, in the pipeline. Uh, so examples being, say, uh, the hash function. That's central to ECMP and link aggregation features. Uh, so we need hash functions. There's a lot of flexibility in how the keys can be constructed, for example, drawing from that, that, uh, uh, that bus of, of intermediate fields and header fields. Uh, we have things like statistics counters. It's another, you know, quite complicated fixed function action. But uh, all of these together, given the way that these can all be used in a flexible, configurable manner, it gives a lot of, lot of power to that, uh, that pipeline. Uh, another complicated chart here, but this is kind of trying to illustrate a little bit about what the motivation for the structure and, and how that pipeline is all uh, organized and defined. So uh, pretty focusing mainly on the forwarding function uh, that, that the pipeline has to perform. No matter what protocol it's po processing, whether it's uh, standard layer two, layer three switching, or Trill, or MPLS, uh, these resources here come into play. So there's a first, a parsing stage. Next, there's some sort of classification uh, lookup that depends on uh, all the literal header fields that are available right in the packet. Um, for layer three switching or routing, this is, of course, looking up a destination IP, applying ACLs. Uh, that then gives a layer two address, which we have a layer two lookup stage. Um, so that's geared mostly for MAC address type lookups. That's providing then a physical destination port mask, which is used for the local chip to determine where the frame is uh, directed. And then on the egress side, we have multicast and then a final frame modification. This slide also goes into all the various numbers of resources that are supported, but that's not very uh, important here. Uh, so here, this is just some high-level stats about the pipeline. Uh, coming out of the parser, there's 12 degrees of iterative processing where the output of the one stages of action can and then be interpreted and uh, feed in, factor into the processing of the next stage. That gives a tremendous amount of flexibility for uh, responding to different conditions about the frame that you may only determine midway through the pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of TCAMs, of course, as you might guess, um, 16 architecturally distinct stages where the parser, for example, counts as one, uh, about 175 individual TCAM um, instances. Same for table lookup, of course, 40 architectural distinct uh, table resources, a lot of parsing modification uh, flexibility. 
Um, overall, we view this as providing a microcode programmable model of, uh, of, of switching. So the, the chip supports a vast uh, space of different protocols and different types of uh, switching algorithms, and uh, it's really up to the programming of a low la layer of uh, configurability in that chip to determine what a particular Alta instance will or will not support, and that's ultimately up to the customer to decide what they want. Of course, it's just a fully provisioned linear pipeline, so it, it's fully provisioned for the max frame rate of 1.1 billion uh, packs per second, and uh, no matter, you know, with no corner cases. So I think the best illustration of the power of the pipeline is to go back to that feature wish list. And, you know, after we froze the spec, of course, there were still ongoing uh, development of protocols and new, uh, new ideas, and uh, virtualization came on the scene. And um, really, I think the best illustration is these are additional protocols and features that have been found to, that Ulta supports after our spec closure. And uh, that's equaling the complexity of the features we, we try to design the pipeline to support. So it's, uh, we're quite proud of that. There are a lot of implementation challenges uh, getting Ulta done. So um, despite these architectural simplifications, trying to go to the most simplest kind of systolic type of pipeline we could come up with, Alta remained a very, very complicated chip. Uh, 1.2 billion transistors in the end. Uh, I give a brief breakdown there of, uh, of a rough breakdown of, of the different design styles, and you can see about half the chip remained custom asynchronous design flow. So that was quite a challenge. We have a very small development team by industry standards, so we began this with literally 30 engineers, and uh, we tried to staff that up as soon as we discovered uh, you know, what, what trouble we were in as much as we could interns, new hires, we moved our software team into chip development they, as well as they could adapt to that. And uh, our Proteus uh, place and route flow, as, as necessary as it was to getting it done, that did give us a lot of grief. Um, it, you know, anytime you're innovating while you're trying to actually deploy and use the tool in development is uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty difficult. So uh, that, that did yield, I mean, in the end, of course, we, uh, we exceeded our area and schedule uh, expectations, but uh, the chip is done. It is in fab right now. We expect samples at the very end of this quarter. Um, this is the chip plot. I think there was a comment yesterday about uh, you know, lamenting that chip plots don't quite look like what they used to. This is an old school chip plot you might appreciate. The highly custom chip, a lot of internal structure, a lot of repeated structures. Uh, we're, we're pretty proud of it. Um, I didn't mention anything about power either, but it will have uh, industry-leading power, about uh, slightly over one watt per port, so maybe 72, 75 watt absolute peak power. That drops very nice and linearly with uh, activity level in the switch. And uh, with that, I guess I'll conclude, and happy to answer any questions. As you ask questions, maybe you can ident you know, identify your name and your association. Uh, yeah, Bill Rash, uh, Intel Corporation. Uh, what process technology is the uh, part on? 65 nanometer GP TSMC. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, so going forward, you have a lot of dynamic logic in there, but the beta ratio of N to P transistors is going to get much closer to unity, uh, you know, 28, 22 nanometer and beyond. Uh, are you guys gonna reevaluate the use of dynamic logic at that point? Well, eventually, it's, uh, it's really the leakage which uh, is a problem for the dynamic logic. So there are ways to staticize and use uh, combinational techniques uh, to achieve the same, same requirements of our design flow. So at some point, yeah, we might have to move away from dynamic logic, but uh, certainly in what we've evaluated so far and process generations accessible to us, we're not, we're not too worried in the immediate future. Uh, how far out are you guys looking? Uh, 22, I mean, that might be the, the furthest at this point. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm very interested in your design. I was wondering if you had uh, been inspired or uh, learned from any of the experiences about asynchronous designs out of the United Kingdom. Uh, well, we're certainly aware of uh, what's been done there. Um, the, our, our design, there's many different ways of, of doing asynchronous design, and ours is certainly different. That they're doing bundled data, as it's, as it's known. Uh, ours is more the quasi-delay insensitive flavor, and we're, we're pretty happy with quasi-delay insensitive and really don't have any intention of changing that aspect of it. So the other thing I was wondering is it looked like all your stages are fee-forward. They're more machines. They're not mealy machines. 
Uh, that's not entirely true. So in the, in the flex pipe, in the frame processing pipeline, sort of by uh, specification, really, the, that, that architecturally is a feedforward pipeline by and large, although there are things like statistics counters, which has feedback and do need to iteratively uh, you know, depend on the output uh, computation. Uh, elsewhere in the scheduler and the data path, uh, there's, it's certainly not just a simple feedforward pipeline. Uh, those are actually at a, at a low microarchitectural level, much more complex circuits than the, the frame pipeline. So it, it's the, the flex pipe itself is, is yes, it's feed forward. Uh, there's no iterative processing, but that doesn't apply uniformly in Alta. So after you gave your system software people the verification task, did they then have the delight of microprogramming things they'd never seen before? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, they, they love it, right? They love the microcode because uh, they're not just at the mercy of what particular hard-coded logic got programmed in, right? They're actually in control of, of what the switch does. So it's actually very synergistic for software development. Thank you. Hi, Shubha Mukherjee, Kavium. A quick question. You mentioned virtualization coming from the mar marketing requirements. Can you comment on what uh, kind of virtualization requirements? Like, are you recognizing virtual machine IDs and setting up queues, or what exactly is the virtualization you're talking about here? Well, uh, honestly, I don't know much beyond the actual names of those protocols, so, and I'm kind of happy about that. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, VN tag is an example. Um, so I, really, I'm, I'm not sure how we're using that uh, for virtualization applications. This is what we have an entire team looking at how to adapt and use the underlying hardware to, to support those protocols. OK, thanks. Sure. Hi, I'm Onkar from Altera. Uh, you did mention that few of the IEEE specification were not fixed where you were in development phase. So how did you approach uh, that thing? Well, that's, that's part of what motivated going to this lower level configurable implementation so that we could deal with that instability. We didn't have to actually hard code those rules, which we weren't totally sure were stable and final or not. Um, so Trill was a good example that uh, uh, simply wasn't clear how that was going to finalize at the time. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Deepak Mittal. Um, how do you handle oversubscription cases? How are the drops decisions made? So in cases of actual congestion? Yeah. So we have a, a one, one of the stages in that pipeline I didn't uh, touch on at all is congestion management. That's probably the most hard-coded part of the whole pipeline. It would have been great to have found some ways to, to make that even more general and flexible. Uh, th that really could be a, a topic of another talk. There's a, a lot of complexity in that congestion management unit. We also have hooks for supporting off-chip FPGA control, kind of feedback loops there for implementing things like QCN, uh, some of these congestion notification types of algorithms. But we have a lot of support. It's quite sophisticated. This is third generation of congestion management now, and uh, it's a, a quite a mature part of the chip. Thanks. Sure. All right, great. Thanks, Mike. All right. OK, so our uh, third uh, talk here will be presented by colleagues here from Cisco. Uh, this is going to now focus on the sort of sophistication and uh, performance aspects of a, a chip that is, uh, you know, implementing a, the adapter functionality between the, the, the uh, wire and the server, if you will. So welcome Mike uh, Gallus and Shrijit Mukherjee from Cisco. Okay, thanks Dan. Uh, so I, I bet a lot of you are probably wondering, why in the heck would Cisco build a NIC chip? I mean, we could buy NIC chips from, um, that's kind of loud. We could buy NIC chips from uh, uh, Intel or Broadcom or QLogic or Emulux or any of those things, so why would we build our own? Well, we had the universal computing system architecture that we wanted to enable, and we really needed convergence, virtualization, um, management, and network services in a way that we couldn't really get. And the way we implemented those is kind of unique, and it's also very important how they work together. And so in this talk, I'm going to tell you about each one of those things, and then I'm going to show you some physical stuff of the 65 nanometer ASIC this is. Um, do, I'm hoping to do some technical deep dive on a few of my favorite hardware implementation decisions, and uh, then Shadit's going to do some uh, driver firmware stuff. So the first one is convergence, and you all know what convergence is, right? It's getting all the network traffic on one wire. 
you know, all your storage traffic, all your management traffic, all your general purpose traffic. Um, and there's a lot of advantages in the data center, you probably know. It's because there's only one switch infrastructure. Uh, it's easier to manage. It's cheaper. Uh, everybody loves convergence. But when I'm talking about convergence, it's a bit more specific. Um, each one of the different types of traffic we're converging has its own requirements for the types of services it needs. Uh, for example, storage traffic, in this case, uh, fiber channel over Ethernet traffic, can't sustain drops. So we run that over a uh, priority flow controlled class, which doesn't drop. Also, management traffic might meet its own um, priority or its own minimum, ba minimum bandwidth guarantee or delivery time. So we can, run, we can handle that separately as well. And then there's also certain kind of traffic we want to shape a certain way or certain kind of traffic that we want to limit a certain way. And that's all going to be converged together. And it all has to be kept very separate from each other. We can't have anything interfering um, one type tra of traffic to another. So when we do convergence, we really want to do it in a way that uh, separates the traffic, gives each individual traffic class its requirements, but also lets them all take the advantage of having a big single fat pipe. Because when you have a big single fat pipe, if your policy allows it for a particular kind of traffic, uh, it can burst at that full speed. And when it's bursting at that full speed, uh, servers being very bursty in their nature, uh, they can all take advantage of it. Um, so what is that big fat pipe? You click on the south side of the chip in the diagram. We actually have two active active ports. Each one of those ports is four XFI plus interfaces. Uh, it's pretty scalable. You could plug in one gigabit ethernet, um, for example, as a minimum. Uh, you, those could also negotiate up to 10 gig. You could plug in two or three or four and have an ether channel going for 20, 30, 40 gig. Or you could do all four uh, fused together in the 40 gigabit ethernet standard. And that's how we get 80 gig, because we have active active on there. So uh, once we have all that converged traffic, uh, a, a really important part of this chip is the virtualization. And when we're talking about virtualization uh, in the hardware side, it's in two ways. One is from the I.O. device side, and one is from the network side. So first, let me talk about the I.O. device side. Uh, this part actually can create 256 PCIe devices on, on the chip itself. And when I say a PCIe device, I, I mean these are really first-class devices. They have their own BDF space, their own config space, their own interrupt space. They have protected memory access to the host. Um, they're really first-class PCI devices. In fact, when the host does its BIOS uh, enumeration and sees these devices and loads drivers, it can't tell the difference between 256 physical cards and this one chip with the 256 virtual devices we have on there. Um, now, there's another kind of virtualization that's often used called SRILV. So that stands for Single Root I.O. Virtualization. What that is, is when you have one physical device with multiple functions underneath it, and then individual functions can be given to different interfaces. Um, we actually support that as well. Any one of those 256 devices on our chip could be an SRIOV device. And we offer both ways, but so far we find most of the customers prefer the uh, physical device virtualization because it's more familiar. Um, operating systems, uh, especially legacy operating systems, uh, understand this, this model easily. Uh, the drivers are simpler, and when we do the physical device virtualization, we can kind of get a more heterogeneous feel. We can have a lot of different types of devices, different numbers, different characteristics, and so we primarily use a physical virtualization. On the network side, um, so we have those 256 devices up there, right? There's going to be 256 network presences facing out to the network. And when I say a network presence, I mean each one of those 256, it's got its own MAC address or MAC addresses. It's got its own VLAN or VLANs. It's got its own multicast groups. It's got its own filtering. It's got a whole bunch of attributes that really define how that presence exists on the network. And so we virtualize all those two, and then we connect them together uh, either through a, an L2 switch sort of thing or something we call a fabric extender, which we use in UCS, um, to connect all that virtualization up and down. And what becomes very important then is now that we have a soup of virtualization, we have 256 devices, we have 256 network presences, and we're interconnecting them in kind of arbitrary ways, whatever is required. We don't want the host operating system or the host server to understand that or deal with it or, or, or need to worry about that at all. So instead, uh, its key is how do we manage this? We actually have um, a processor you can see on the little diagram. This little processor down there, it's a MIPS R24000 processor. It's uh, got its own interface, its own, you can see those little 
little nick there. I put it. It's got its own secure interface that it uses to connect to some kind of a management console or some kind of a management program out there on the internet. And here's how it might work. If you're on the management console and you say, okay, I want this particular server um, to have maybe 57 Ethernet VNICs and 12 HBAs and maybe a management interface and maybe some special user space stuff, you would connect to that processor and send it down by a secure protocol. And the next time that server rebooted, um, the BIOS on the server would just naturally, well, the embedded processor would build that, that PCI space that you've specified on the chip. Uh, the BIOS would then enumerate it and see the, whatever uh, IO, dev, IO structure you've decided for that server, and, and it would just go with that. Uh, just its natural device discovery would take care of configuring it on the server side. So there's a very little the server has to do other than its natural uh, enumeration and driver loading and all the complexity of how we configured it, what, what are the attributes and all that stuff is kept down in our management. Um, and you can see how powerful that might be if you have a whole bank of servers. You're like, okay, this guy needs a specific set, maybe uh, you know, up to hundreds of Ethernet devices, or he might need some fiber channel devices, and you can have either a very heterogeneous or a very homogeneous um, set of I.O. configurations, but it's quite easy to change them and reconfigure. Uh, you also get this other nice little thing. Um, if you have a management processor on there, and we've got all those, you know, those eight XFIs with different, there's a lot of physical details it takes to, to bring up these links. Sometimes there's a negotiation process with the ether channel, there's gonna be some kind of a little protocol. All that stuff, again, you don't want the host driver, the host operating system to know about it or deal with it or it just gets to be a mess. So we actually handle all the physical link bring up and, and uh, policies with that embedded processor and the host just sees a very simple link up, link down, use the interface. And, and that also is a big advantage because we have a couple generations of this. You can move the same exact host driver across generations without changing it and we handle all the kind of sticky details of this chip in that embedded processor. Oh, there's one other nice thing you get with that embedded processor. So say you had an interface that was on the host and it had an Ethernet interface and it's sending packets, it's receiving packets and everything's going great. But whatever link it was using fails or the switch fails or something bad happens in the network. Well, our little processor there, it can recognize that and it can reroute if the policy allows. It can reroute to an alternate link to the other side and the host uh, operating system and driver doesn't even need to know about it. He doesn't need teaming drivers or, or um, any kind of special awareness. It just kind of gets the fault tolerance with the generic driver. Um, another key thing is network services. So you can imagine if you have a system that has 256 VNICs and 256 network presences, you probably have a hypervisor, you're running all these operating systems. The number of unique connections and the type of traffic that's flowing across just this one ship is, is quite varied, especially when now we've got multi-core up there in, in, the, in the x86. And if we really wanted to track every one of those flows and apply a particular service to every one of those flows, it's very difficult to do that in the switch because the switch might have dozens and dozens of or even more if there's oversubscription service hooked up to it, it would really have to have uh, an awful lot of state to understand everything. So by pushing that out to the edge here, to the um, adapter, we can track all flows that go into that host. This particular chip can track 16 million flows um, going in and out, and we can apply specific policies to each flow if, if that's desirable. Oh, also, this is another way these different technologies work together. If we have those services there, it's not something I want to expose to the host. I don't want the host to have to uh, understand it. And sometimes for security reasons, I don't even want the host to know I'm applying a firewall or some other service that might be interesting. So um, the, again, our embedded processor there is the thing that uh, will configure and connect and, and run those services without the, the virtualized or non-virtualized host having to know about it. Okay, so we're getting to the physical here. Um, this is a TI-65 nanometer ASIC. Um, I'll let you read all the, the numbers at your leisure, but I'll show you quickly on that, um, on that block diagram, the floor plan. On the right side up there, uh, you can see eight XFI ports. Those are uh, just the 10 gig interfaces. Um, on the south side down there, there's the PCI Express, those dark blue blocks. That's a BI-16 Gen 2 PCI Express interface. And you also see up on the north side, there's one more SIRTI. So that's actually a, a single gigabit Ethernet port, and we use that for local local server management stuff. For example, if there's a baseboard module controller on the server, we would hook that to Ethernet. And then there's a nice advantage because then we converge that traffic to our uplink and we can also apply all our virtualization, remapping, and other things because it's going through the same engine uh, that all the other interfaces are going through. 
Okay, I can talk a little bit about some of these fun little problems I ran into. So the la the, I was talking about network services, and this is just an example of the hardware uh, I kind of put together to handle it. And if you can imagine, we'll kind of do a day in the life of a packet real quick coming through this thing. It's called a classifier flow table. The packet comes in from the bottom here, and, and it gets splits into L2, L3, L4, L5 uh, header segments and some metadata that describes about the packet. And when, it, when the packet came in, it came in on one of those 256 virtual network interfaces. And so that particular network interface had a particular policy, and maybe you're looking for uh, ICMP traffic, or you may be looking for V6 traffic, or you may be looking for an application traffic on that particular interface. So the first thing we do is we look up which, which of the 256 interfaces it came up on. We load our rules about where in the L2 through L5 header and metadata to look for the keys. We make a key, we send it through a TCAM, do a match, and then we say, oh, okay, now we've got, you know, interface 17, ICMP traffic, or what have you. We now want to look at the exact flow, not just the general flow type, the exact flow. So now that policy would send it to the flow table. It does another, um, then it breaks down those headers into up to eight tuples inside the header. So now you can look at, uh, you know, probably source address, destination address, source port, destination port, maybe some application tags, whatever you want, up to a 40 byte key. We hash that down, uh, we get a 24 bit index, and there's your 16 million flows. These are actually stored in an uh, off chip memory. We don't have that much memory on this chip. This, uh, it's just one little DRAM, and um, it, the pack, it's, it's fairly low bandwidth because packets never go through that. We just use that for the flow table information and also um, uh, configuration. That little processor can run out of that thing too. So it gives us enough to run, we actually run Linux on that processor, so it's got uh, enough memory to do that. Uh, we also have some L2 caching to, uh, to make the performance work out, L1, L2 caching. Um, when you, oh, so when you finally, when you finally, after all that process, now you finally identified, okay, this is the exact ICMP flow we want, then on a per flow basis in that flow record, it says, okay, now you can drop that flow or steer that flow to a different place or maybe make it a higher priority interrupt going to the host or maybe just count it, maybe just do a packet and byte count for net flow statistics or maybe you want to wrap it up in a GRE channel and send it off somewhere else. So you can just, depending on the exact flow, you can apply these policies. Okay, here is another interesting little problem I ran into. Reducing latency is pretty important uh, in the data center for some applications. Um, and one of the problems here, we've got, we've got to be fully compatible with legacy um, uh, drivers. So how can we, one of the problems with the legacy drivers that we use, and actually this is a very uh, typical driver architecture, that being that the, the, the driver will build its packet in in data buffers in memory, and then it'll build a descriptor list, and write the descriptors point to the packets, and then when that's ready, then the driver will write, uh, do a PIO write to the device, a doorbell, say, okay, go get your packet. And the reason that's kind of bad for latency is now the device has got to go read the descriptor and then get the response, and then unwrap that descriptor and decide what's a packet, and it's like, oh, here's a pointer to the data, now I've got to read the data, and it's that, it's that link list, that, that two-step link list that kind of hurts on latency. So, how can we make that better, but still retain the exact same software model? Uh, well, one thing we noticed is that the lower 12 bits of that PIO write that we do to the device are used to say which, what the index that of, of, of uh, descriptoring up to 4,000 entries, that's the index of the descriptoring. But the upper 52 bits are reserved, they're not being used. So why don't we just kind of throw a data buffer pointer hint in those upper 52 bits? It's still the same number of transactions, but now when the PIO write comes down to the device, it says, okay, here's the descriptor index you need to get. Oh, and by the way, I'm pretty sure this is the data that packet's gonna end up being. The device will fetch the descriptor like it normally does, and it'll also at the same time do a prefetch to the data buffer. When that comes back, it'll build, it'll unwrap the descriptor, go grab the packet, it's saying, oh, look, we've already prefetched, it's, it's local, it goes out, and it basically changes two round trip reads to the host to one round trip read to the host. And it's nice because uh, the old driver that didn't know about prefetching works fine because it just always zeroes out the hint. And the new driver on the old hardware works fine too because the hint goes into reserve bits and, and nobody really bothers with it. So it's a, it was a nice forward-backward compatibility latency reduction change. Uh, the last little thing I'm going to talk about, I'll be really quick here. I'm running out of time. Um, Scheduling is a big deal. Okay, so we've got 256 devices, and we actually have a thousand queues because the devices can remap arbitrarily how many queues they want. It lets us do some, it lets us make fancier devices with multiple queues, maybe with different classes of service within a device. 
but we need to make sure that we maintain fair scheduling to this big converged network we have, right? So at the top level, first we look at, uh, we do a weighted round robin across priority, the, the, the eight classes of service on Ethernet, and then uh, for everybody in a particular priority, we go down and look across our 256 VNICs and we choose a winner there, and then for inside that VNIC we look down into our 1,000 work keys and we choose his winner. Then it kind of bubbles up uh, to give the, the sharing of bandwidth that you want. And in addition, there's two more interesting uh, features that you see on the bottom. One is per VNIC rate limiting, that's, and that's with megabit precision. So you might say, oh, this VNIC over here it cannot exceed 37 megabits no matter what happens. Uh, and actually, one that customers maybe like even more is the CIR, which is committed information rate. And that lets you say, okay, so for these three VNICs, um, they're each gigabit VNICs, and we guarantee a minimum of gigabit service over our converged network. Um, but if you use, once you've used, once everybody's had a chance and used, gotten their gigabit, if at the end of that uh, scheduling token round, there's still bandwidth left over, then they share equally. So it's kind of like minimum bandwidth to gigabit, and you can burst up to as much as left over, as much as not being used by everybody else. And you only have a oh. few minutes, Shajit, to do your, sorry about that. Oh, no, no worries. Um, I should start with a disclosure. I'm actually a software guy masquerading as a chip guy. Um, but um, I want to take a few seconds to talk about what the context is at a much higher level than where Mike was so far. So he started with the question of why are we building a chip? Why is there a NIC being built here? The fundamental reason was that the way virtualization was being approached, the way current data center architectures were being approached, there wasn't really the end-to-end -end systems perspective. And what we'll show here is a couple of technologies that is there in this ASIC that will allow us to fulfill some of the systems requirements that are there. So let's take a look a little bit at where things are today, the status quo, if you will. Um, scale out, which is the predominant architecture today that is out there in data centers in the enterprise place, has made management quite a complex thing because you have all these gazillions of endpoints that need to be managed, need to be configured. On top of that, today everybody realizes that for performance, SRIOV, direct device assignment, and ways to bypass the hypervisor or the kernel is the way to get performance, is the way to get efficiency. But SRIOV actually creates a bigger problem because now not only do you, have a, do you have a gazillion endpoints, you have hundreds of interfaces on top of them that you need to configure, manage, and, and operate. So if you look at a, a traditional SRIOV stack at a system level, what you see is something that looks like this. You have your host sitting up there which has some enumeration of devices, and underneath it you have your switches which have their own configuration which is managed by somebody else, Underneath that, you have some network configuration, some fabric configuration, some parameters, some tuning that you need to do that is application specific. And today, there's sort of a an opaque layer over here, and the two don't even need to talk to each other. So the configuration flow, if you will, goes this way, and then that way, and you hope that the two shall meet. What our solution does, which is sort of a, a packaging and overall architecture around what, uh, what Mike was describing, is that we basically make the whole flow go inside out. The network decides what kind of network it is, what kind of parameters it can support, what kind of performance it can support, what rate limits do you need, what features do you need, et cetera, et cetera. And then those interfaces get configured via VN tags, as somebody mentioned in a previous talk, um, as virtual ports on the physical switch. And each of those virtual ports then becomes a virtual interface on the host. These interfaces, like Mike was saying, can be shaped on demand. They can be placed effectively in the host as an Ethernet port, as a fiber channel port, as a low latency port, et cetera, et cetera. And the host just boots, discovers, and starts going. The, there is no configuration required. The host just found a fully configured, fully plumbed, if you will, system that's ready to go. And one of the, I mean, a couple of things are required to make this happen. We need the ability of creating these virtual ports, which is why we need the ability to virtualize on the PCI side in the north and on the network side in the south. We also build in things like automatic failover that Mike was mentioning, because if you don't have it, you still then require a software entity in between this hardware virtualization, if you will. So this is sort of the overarching view. This is what we wanted to do. You go down this path and you say, okay, now I have, I have direct device assignment, I have high performance, I can do all of these awesome things. You run into other system issues. 
and you need to address them. One of the big issues, for example, is how intraps and hardware resources are managed. Typical traditional servers, while your IDT entries, your intrap vector tables, et cetera, can support sometimes thousands of entries, they're built for supporting maybe tens of devices. Your intrap resources run low very quickly, your heap runs low very quickly, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the numbers, for example, right, so if you ha just have 50 virtual machines, for example, in a host, and you're using eight MSIX vectors, which is traditional for a standard NIC, you run into a number that most operating systems will not be able to support in terms of IDT entries. So, um, and clearly, you want to do something about this because you also don't want 400 vectors slamming your 16 core system, which is completely a waste of its resources. So one of the things that this ASIC can do is we have this concept of something called interrupt groups or interrupt gangs. Effectively, what you get as a result is each device generates interrupts or each virtual device generates interrupts as it normally would, but, and it gets rate limited, it gets interrupt coalescing timers get applied, et cetera, et cetera. But as a policy, you get to gang them all into a vector. The vector sends a single DMA write to the host with sort of the bit vector membership or the gang membership, if you will, and there's one interrupt to the host, and the host can then go ahead and schedule the interrupt handlers, and you do not take the unnecessary context switch and the interrupt storm on the host. Now you can apply policies to the gang that are specific to, the, to how you want your host sockets to get loaded and get the best optimal coalescing and scheduling that you can get for interrupts. Another technology that we put in along the same lines for getting really high efficiency, if you have lots and lots of streams, lots and lots of flows on top of lots and lots of interfaces, and of course, running in lots and lots of virtual machines, you have the problem that you're spending a significant portion of your time just copying packets around. In, in a traditional Ethernet sense, most of your time is spent, most of your energy and time is spent moving the bytes, mem copying the bytes from a network packet buffer to a host application packet buffer. If you look at a traditional stack, it kind of sort of looks like this. You have packets coming in on the wire. The kernel will sort of demux them, put them into its unique flows, and then do a copy into an application buffer. One of the things that our ASIC can do is it has, we, we make use of the fact that we have this very sophisticated classification capability, and we create this concept of two kinds of rings. There's this new concept of a streaming data ring which effectively mimics the application's buffers. Effectively, it's a pointer to the application buffer. And when packets arrive on the wire, hardware will strip it out, will actually classify it to one particular flow queue. And on that flow queue, we will strip the headers out and put them on what used to look like the traditional buffers from here. So if you look here, the headers are exactly placed the way it was, and the payload is pulled out and put into this contiguous buffer. The advantage, I mean, this is a very simple, very, very effective mechanism. You are, there is no sophistication, there is no knowledge of state or anything to that, of, of that kind. If for some reason, hardware says that the next byte, according to some offset, say TCP offset, is not the right byte, all it'll do is it'll hold on to the payload in this buffer itself, and software will have to come and patch it up. But basically, for transactional TCP type uh, uh, operations, which is most of what happens on the internet today, um, this will work fine most of the time. And that's all we were aiming for. I think that's all I had. The last thing I wanted to point out was some, you know, everybody has at this point, or everybody's announcing a 40 gig adapter. We also have one. It was kind of not very interesting to talk about the fact that we can hit 40 gig. So instead, what we show you is a couple of user space stacks that we built as one of our virtual devices. And the graphs here, which can be perused at your own leisure, is this is latency. This is latency through a standard kernel interface. This is our latency when connected through a user space stack. This is throughput, which is actually almost more interesting. This is a ping pong test. It's two sides just ping, you know, bouncing against each other. And this is the standard kernel throughput, and you can see that it takes a long time to get warmed up, whereas when you go through a user space stack on our ASIC, we actually hit 10 gig, at about, which you can't see over here, it's right around there, at around 16K buffer size. So just four pages of data, and you get to saturate your 10 gig wire. Uh, that's all I had. 
And I guess we'll move on to questions. Yeah, any questions? Hi, John Delaney. I was wondering if you could explain what you mean by the term legacy OS. You kind of waffled over that. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let the OS expert tell you about that. Well, um, fundamentally, in this context, it's actually one very simple point, and that is OSs that did not have SRIOV support or did not have support for MSIX or any of these quote-unquote virtualization structures that are being imposed on the current platform. So if you look at what it takes for most devices to be able to sort of multi-incarnate themselves. You need some support from the BIOS, you need some support from the operating system, you need some support from the PCI subsystem or whatever device resource management scheme your particular OS has. And if you look today amongst, if you say, three major OSs in shipping volume, only one truly has SRIV and other such constructs supported. And really what Mike meant by legacy OS was being able to insert this device into an OS that's shipping today without requiring any forklift upgrade of your OS infrastructure. You're doing, you're doing an excellent job of impersonating a marketing person. I was, <laughs> I was hoping that you would say names yeah. like Windows, you know, Yeah, so, so to, to Linux is the only one that supports it today. If you look at uh, uh, Windows, Windows does not have any support for SRIOV. If you look at ESX, ESX has no support for SRIOV, et cetera, et cetera. I, and how about FreeBSD? FreeBSD actually is not one of the OSs we have been looking at, but the kernel, I'm sure, has support for it. Okay, that but means... There will, there will be some Intel people here who can probably answer the question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Alex, so Mike, of Hike M Systems. Uh, could you uh, say something about switching between those virtual devices? Do you do switching inside the chip, or you go through the whatever? Standard switch. switching, you said between switching virtual between virtual devices, OS, between, devi oh, yeah. between devices. You, oh, you mean, are, are you talking about the case when you might transmit a packet and uh, it needs to be switched to your neighbor that's on the same yeah. host, right? Yeah. So yes, so it, that's that has to do with the way the policy has been set up. And for our universal computing system, we use uh, VNTAG such that all the traffic is going to go up to the switch. So that in case the switch wants to apply a um, a policy or something special to that traffic before it comes back down. If you are not using the, the ASIC in VNTAG mode, if you're using it in what we call classical Ethernet mode, then that switch would work just like a classical Ethernet switch. If you're sending a, a, a packet up and it, it recognizes the MAC address you know, that's locally, it'll send it to there. If it's multicast, it has to loop it back and send it up. So there's kind of two modes. There's, there's the fabric extender mode, and then there's the uh, local classical Ethernet switching mode. So the chip itself includes uh, this... Uh, it does both, yeah. It, or okay. Either. It depends on the, de de the deployment, you know, what the customer has chosen. And it's a learning switch, I should It add. learns, yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, Charlie Demergen, Semi-Accurate. Um, when you first came out with the UCS stuff, um, you had daughter cards and I, you had your own chip and then a, a NIC or a fiber channel or whatever it was. Right. That, it was called Palo. It was Palo the predecessor to this chip. And Palo and Menlo, yeah. Um, right. Is this, yeah, that was my question. Yes, <laughs> yes and this is the follow-on to, to, uh, to Palo. And many of the, the functions we talked about, not all of these, but many of them are supported in Palo as well. Hi, um, James Tringali from Rambus. Uh, you talked about the uh, idea of uh, interrupt grouping and um, you know, usually an interrupt happens, you want to service it. How do you determine when it's time to present the group uh, to the processor for? No, so, so the idea is that, you know, just, just like anything else, if you look at how, in a virtual machine environment, let's take that as a more concrete example, there are already things like C groups and other processor groups that the hypervisor is managing, right? So this would basically be yet another knob that you would say, this is how I control the load on my physical CPU for this group of virtual machines. Or they could be grouped by network policy. That would be the other way to do it, is to say there are low-performance network devices, there are high-performance network devices. All my low-performance network devices are always ganged together, and we always generate a single interrupt for that entire gang. Thirdly, the other option on bare metal would be to say, I'm going to call it one group per core. Because that really doesn't make any sense to say I'm going to generate 400 interrupts on a two-core system, right? Because 
what does that mean? It's going to come at all the unnatural times and just mess everything up. So let's just say I'm going to limit my two cores to getting 2,000 interrupts per second or 8,000 interrupts per second, and that's it. And everybody, every device in the system is going to belong to one of those two groups. Okay, thank you. Rick Merritt from EE Times. Uh, could you just clarify your, your opinions about SRIOV? Uh, I had some indication there that maybe you were suggesting that in some ways it needs to have a, a, an upgrade so that you don't have to do some of the things that you were doing. Uh, uh, SRIOV is fine. It, 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 it enables all sorts of, of good things. Uh, when we came to market with ECS, it wasn't quite in the operating systems yet, and it wasn't quite in the devices yet. So that's why we kind of did our own version of the physical virtualization. And after that, like I was saying, it, we realized that there were some other benefits to that, like, oh, we can do a more heterogeneous devices, we can do a few more different organizations. Um, but SRIOV does solve a lot of those problems in a slightly different way. I, I think that both are valid. We're supporting both. Um, yeah, so I, th I, think, uh, I think the first answer to your question is we don't have an opinion regarding SRIOV. We no, support it's fine, it. Yeah. Um, I th as Mike said, we had to recognize reality, which was some platforms, like Windows, for example, did not have support for SRIOV. Platforms like ESX did not have support for SRIOV. So we had to overcome that as a challenge. It turns out SRIOV, like Mike said, is beyond being the hardware construct, there are a lot of software implications to it, how the OS manages it. Some of those things get a lot easier when SRIOV gets introduced and gets inducted into the model. And we not only support it, we can actually do things that so our, our only thing to say is that SRIOV is not a prerequisite to the conversation around multiple devices in our architecture, which is not true across the board, right? Gotcha. Hi, I have uh, two questions. The first question is very simple. Uh, <laughs> can you comment on the performance cost comparison versus uh, Intel's 10 genic card? That's one. And the second is, uh, in your VNIC, when you are doing the resource allocations in terms of uh, queues and uh, VFs, I assume it's initially uh, statically allocated across uh, uh, each new virtual machine, but what if uh, there's uh, uh, resource conflictions? Uh, can you do the dynamic uh, uh, resource allocations and how flexible it is? Thank you. Sure. Okay, yeah, the, I mean, the first question the first? <laughs> is, uh, yeah, we, we make this chip for ourselves. We do not make this chip for sale. Um, it, the cost is fine for us. You know, if we buy, when we buy Intel's Niantic chip, we have to buy it. So it's, I mean, it's not, it's a wash. So I'll address the second part of the question about how do queues and resource allocations go. So since this was a hot chips conversation, we actually skipped that whole management aspect of things. But the way the system works, the way the UCS system works is everything is dynamically allocated. So when a virtual machine wakes up, we actually get what we call a port profile that goes all the way through, kind of like the arrow that I was showing. It goes all the way through to the fabric. And then from the fabric on its way back, we configure everything in the path. So what you get in the beginning is just a PCI shell that has no parameters, no, it has no MAC address, it has no identity, it has nothing. But when we connect it through, then we configure everything. So every VM that comes up will get its own perfect device. Now, resource conflict management, our general strategy is you don't want to have, you want to have predictive failures. You don't want to find that something failed halfway through a process. So we do do allocation upfront, or we do reservation up front, but the actual allocation is dynamic and it is at runtime. Last question. Last question. Uh, Mukesh Kark, um, my question is regarding the 16 million flows you support. Uh, is, these are dynamic flows and how much memory is needed? How do you um, uh, close those flows and can you highlight some of those? Well, well yeah, when we, we identify the flow, um, and they get stored in a record in, in memory, and the record could be either 32 bytes or 64 bytes per record, uh, depending on what features you've enabled and what you want to do. And then you would choose your table size for the appropriate. Usually, people, we usually would not do 16 million because it is pretty hungry in memory. But on the other hand, we do have an external DDR part. So you know, it's, it's, it's a trade-off of how much memory you want to throw to flow tables versus how much memory you want to throw to lots and lots of software that somebody's written that takes lots and lots of memory up. Um, Don't look at me. <laughs> Uh, so, um, what, was there a second part? You had a second part of the question? Or, sorry. Just uh, curious about dynamic flows, they need to be closed. Oh, oh closing dynamic right. flows, yes, so, yes, yes. So hardware will insert flows automatically if that's the policy for the, 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 um, 
the device and the interface and the, the classification result. Um, and, and you can see how old the flow is by timestamp that floats around there, but aging out the flows is going to have to be done by the software. The software, that little embedded processor is going to do a lazy, a lazy perusal of the flow tables and it'll shoot down according to the policies it decides. It can be pretty slow about it, though. Is that it? Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. I, I guess being from Cisco, I should actually give these guys credit. They, they mentioned it's, oh, it's just a 40 gig NIC. I mean, actually out there, there's only, th this is one of the first 40 gig NICs. It's one of the only, I think the only other one is from Mellanox, it's a dual 40 gig NIC. So that's just one little extra thing. But anyway,